Hi, I'm, I'm Arjun. I'm here today with Rupa Krishnamurti. We met about 10 years back when I was getting very frustrated looking for someone to work on for acoustic design for our projects. And I must say she's one of the few professional acoustic consultants I've had the privilege of meeting in India and one of the best people we've worked with. So we invited her in today to talk a bit about her work and about what goes into acoustics. She's been doing acoustics for about 14 years. She did her master's in acoustics from the University of Salford at Manchester. And um, well, yeah, with that intro, Rupa, let me ask you, what inspired you to start your career in acoustics? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, don't buy what Arjun's saying. He's always been effusive and sweet. Uh, so, so I think I'll start with reciprocating that among the people I've worked with, Cinebels has had very good work ethics and they're very clear about the kind of systems they sell and it's been a privilege working with them all these years. Um, as to what got me into acoustics, it was uh, an absolute accident, which was, um, so the, the precursor was that I loved maths, physics and music. Uh, my father spent, I think, what was the equivalent of his month's salary on a music system in the 1980s and uh, we've pretty much had the best childhood in front of it um, and and in I took up electronics engineering because you know we were all getting into engineering by the cartloads in Bangalore those days and uh, but electronics did not inspire much uh, love and I eventually saw this I, I was even settling in for a masters in the US uh, in DSP because it was the likely course of things but while waiting for my visa, I saw this advertisement in a newspaper about some university from the UK coming in and talking about music technology masters. And it was the first time I felt happy and you know I could feel stirrings in my heart for, for what I was reading. And I'd forgotten what that joy was like, um, pretty much. So I, I just kind of went down that rabbit hole and then I landed up on the University of Salford that was coming in next week and I looked at the subjects they were teaching and I my heart started walking on it and uh, I told my mother you know the I'm doing the MS and it's all set but it my it's just it just doesn't feel the same so I looked around and I asked people and there were no answers as to you know what profession what what will you do in that space in India. Nobody for kilometers around me, hundreds of kilometers around me had ever heard of an acoustical consultant and neither had I. I had no answers but I kudos say, to my parents, you know. I they, would say that's still the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, not as much as it was then and uh, I'm kudos to my parents, you know, they're very middle class. You could predict salaries to the decimal pretty much and, you know, they, they helped me take a loan and do this master's. Um, uh, when I had no answers to, you know, beta ap khaoge, kya khilaoge, kya, <laughs> you know, pretty much. But they said t I was in a good IT job then, and it was I had more money then to to, to spend, and I knew what to do with. Uh, so my calculation was that if I came back and did the same IT job, I'll be able to make my loan, you know, and my living expenses meet. So I can handle that. So, so I took that risk and I, I did the masters and I said for if nothing else I would have got something under my belt and can always come back to the same thing. So that's yes. that's how I did this. <laughs> so in a couple of things you said, uh, one reminded me and we can, I'm going to ask you about it later, the conversation that we had about how to inspire the love for music in children. It sounded like mm -hmm. that exposure you had in your childhood is what got you on the path. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd like to ask what are the kind of projects you work on because I think like I said I think for a lot of us acoustics is still this black box right so where do you right. where do you work which um, fields or maybe so where do you not work because I think acoustics are everywhere so I initially got into this field because I thought it was the perfect amalgam of my interest in music physics and maths and also because I was a serial concert hopper in my younger days uh, I used to buy the seasons pass for fort uh, Carnatic festival and <laughs> all of that but uh, it, what I eventually realized was uh, it, acoustics is about the science of sound so it's very very parallel to the science of noise <laughs> as well so a lot of the work we do is really noise mitigation speech privacy speech intelligibility mapping uh, you know speaker coverage mapping we also uh, but a bulk of what I do is still 
uh, low frequency control in small rooms which is a field of interest and at one point i'd contemplating looking at a phd in that but oh, wow. uh, no so. no <laughs> there's <laughs> a lot to do on ground uh, and possibly in another lifetime or maybe when my kids are grown up i'll probably look at it but so when you say low frequency mapping in small rooms it's typically home theaters yeah yeah so when we say right. small we mean small with respect to the wavelength of sound hmm. so we hear frequencies from 17 uh you know from from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and the size of these waves is from 17 feet to 17 millimeters and everything that comes out of a subwoofer is upwards of 10 feet in size 10 to 17 feet typically so in a room unique to the set of uh unique to the dimensions of each room there's always a set of frequencies whose wavelengths form an exact match with the dimensions of these rooms so let's say you have a 12 foot room and a 100 hertz wave uh, is say 11 foot 3 inches in size uh it it every time it bounces off a wall it'll be off by 9 inches right so the peaks and the nulls don't intensify at the same spots whereas a, a foot a, a wave that is exactly 12 foot in size will form peaks and nulls at the same quarter wavelength spots and these are called standing waves so how a person experiences this is if you were to close your ears and close one ear and walk around a room while playing a pure sine tone you will see visible dips in amplitude and in most cases the dips are so bad it's it's of the, it's, it's a 15 20 25 db dip sometimes so every 10 db is a doubling of the perceived loudness level so we perceive loudness logarithmically uh so if if i bring something down by 10 db i will perceive it as being half as loud mm. uh or if i increase it by 10 db it will feel double as loud to me so if you have dips of the of this order two people sitting next to each other on a recliner one at a null one at a peak would feel vastly different amounts of bass and you have two people complaining one saying the bass is too high and one saying i can't feel anything at all and and yeah i mean like we need enough reasons to <laughs> to you know because <laughs> you have uh you know it there's some people and there are studios we've seen you know you especially like recording studios where you walk in and you know you can't hear the bass at all in that room because the room is so small that it's all nulls you know it really you can't even experience a certain amount of bass um because the real estate is optimized for like a a, a table a couple of chairs maybe some chairs at the back uh, really not much so what really ends up happening is that when you are working on a uh, uh, small rooms when we say small again we mean room sizes like 12 feet 20 feet within 30 feet each dimension pretty much these are classified as small rooms and sometimes clients don't take it very well when we say no small room yeah. problems are different from large halls They're like this is not a small <laughs> room like, no, I mean, we mean with respect to the wavelength of sound <laughs> so so but that's interesting you just talked about recording studios and that's where people master the music of the movies so you do acoustics there and you do acoustics in home theaters where people consume audio yes audio so yes. would you say they're both equally important or i would say um having acoustics done at the source as well as at the consumption level very much i think there's a i mean all sound engineers know this that they end up overcompensating for the bass in many of the recordings when they are not able to hear it clearly where they are sitting and very often they are sitting where all the nulls are which is closer to the center of the room because the bass energy always increases around the edges of the room so if you take a mic and walk around you'll see high energy along the sides and around the nulls they're usually exactly where you're sitting <laughs> the guy who's paid for the whole thing so uh these are things to bear in mind when but but what how how you treat it is you, you you treat a a null the same way as you treat a peak so if you reduce the amplitude of the peak using a good bass trap you can then reduce the amplitude of the null effectively so the nulls also stop being that intense you start actually hearing bass in that same spot where you just didn't hear it earlier so we've done uh, a that was one of the first projects i did remotely <laughs> way before remote work was a thing was when my kids were really small and someone called from pune saying um i have a room of this size and i'm not i've heard these speakers outside and they sound a lot better they're not sounding the same in my room 
and uh, I looked at the dimensions of the room and I figured out that there's something known as the Schroeder frequency which is uh, the frequency below which a room acts more modal than specular and uh, what does that mean so sound has dual nature it is particle like as well as wave like unlike light which is essentially particle it's a spec so you can treat it like a you know so it follows snell's law of reflection angle of incidence is equal to the angle mm. you can predict it geometrically as to where the shadow regions would be now that in the case of sound only happens for the higher frequencies where the wavelengths are progressively getting smaller uh, for these large wavelength low frequency sounds you can't really predict the base very you can't predict the shadow regions very efficiently because these things tend to bend around a sofa so in fact, um, I've always read this and we talk about this and maybe this explains it that we always say high frequencies are directional so you yes. can tell where it's coming from. So like if I'm walking from left to right, you, my voice follows yes. my walking whereas bass, if it's you know Diwali, if it's a bomb blast or if it's a subwoofer, it doesn't matter where it's placed, you just feel it. You can't really pinpoint Pretty where much. it is. So is that yeah, base is, is actually very that? omnidirectional. So uh, to a good extent where you place a sub in the room is less important. Uh, you, you'll pretty much hear it everywhere. Whereas if you're slightly off axis, you may not get a full experience of the highs. Hmm. So that's important. But yeah, base placement, the, the, sp the placement of the subwoofers in the room is of certain importance depending on whether it's front ported or back ported and all of these things where the vent comes in. But the other aspect is also if you place it at a certain optimal position you can at least optimize it for the sitting position to be reasonably getting a lot of the energy so that way we do play around with it on a software to see how it works oh. but uh, you still need a lot of the bass traps in the room to make it sound yeah. good <laughs> that's not going to circumvent the fact that you need the bass yeah. traps also before we talk more about acoustics in a home theater setting uh, Tell me about some memorable project you did, which is because I know when we've spoken, you've done large halls and like you said, in a small room, mm -hmm. maybe low frequencies are the biggest challenge yeah. in a larger, in an auditorium or I know you've done the metro station mm -mm. in Chennai. Right. What are the, so what is a memorable pro project you've done and what are the kind of challenges you face if it's not a home theater context? Okay. It, we just recently finished a mosque project in Wayanad and uh, this was a you know, equidistant uh, set of walls and what really happened was uh, a lot of the, I mean, I think close to 80% of what we recommended didn't really get done because of all reasons, uh, budget and COVID and so many things that happened along the way. Um, but the little they did has kept the place functional. <laughs> You know, the less than 10% that actually got done has, has kept it functional and you can still make out what's being said and, you know, it's obviously not as great as it could have been, but... Um, so, it's, in, a, it's in, a, in a setting like that, would you say speech intelligibility is, is of very primary important, importance? Yes. And also, I think you try not to excite um, the, the dome, you know, for instance. Hmm. You, you try not to beam anything in that direction so that because you're not treating it. Um, and and similarly, I think one of the things you want in a home theater or in an auditorium is for sound to sound like a choppy sea. Uh, a classmate of mine in UK used this uh, the day we had our first room acoustics class. And uh, this beautiful explanation has stayed with me ever since and I use it frequently. Um, which is that what you don't want is a tsunami. You want a choppy sea. You want diffuse sound so that everything sounds even and toned and you know. So uh, that's something you aim for in a home theater as well as a, a large space. Now in a home theater, the LF can be really wild. It's hard to tame it and you know, you, that, that's a really big problem. But in a larger space, you know, let's say a 100 foot hall, a 17 foot long wave will even itself out over multiple yeah. reflections. So the low frequency problems are not really very prominent in larger spaces. There you only treat it for reverberation. And reverberation for the, is usually measured from 125 hertz to 4K and those are usually not much of a problem in home theatres. At least they can be very easily fixed. Uh, 
But these larger waves, 10 foot long waves, they don't see two inches of treatment at all. So that's where you need depth. That's why the base traps come in the corner because that's where you get the maximum depth. And uh, But yeah, this was one project where strategically placing the minimal amount of treatment worked. And Easy. I had to, you know, if I had a, a Murti of Newton, I would go and <laughs> put flowers there and say, Meri Laj Rakhli. <laughs> now, I remember the, the one dome I've seen, the Royal Albert, Royal Albert Hall in London. And that's, I think, one of the best sounding halls I've been in. And they've got so many elements hanging from the... Yeah, about 512 mushroom clouds. Yeah. So that there's really a helpful. there's a funny story to that. Um, I think I I read this on Wiki somewhere that uh, there is a concept for these larger halls, which is volume per person, an ideal volume per person. Hmm. So, given the floor area, what is the volume per person that you have? So you try and optimize that um, to to uh, to the extent possible, and there is a direct correlation between that and how good a space sounds. Um, so I think one of my side projects was that uh, my husband had a paid version of Tableau and I had this book by Berenek where he documents data about 77 concert halls. So I played with that data, tweaked it to two parameters which was basically volume per person and the reverberation time of the space and I got a lovely correlation my P and R square were looking very good uh, and and this was it basically goes to show that there is th this this whole volume aspect is very important when you're designing as so to how expansive how immersive it sounds mm. and all of that so at the Royal Albert Hall at the time that it was designed it had far too much volume per person Oh, so and, the and getting in too. good early reflections was a hard job. Hmm. So the what gives you a feeling of how expansive a place is are the reflections that come in after 300 milliseconds. So if a lot of your content is coming into your ears after that time slot, you automatically perceive the space to be very spacious, voluminous. Because in a in a large space we're used to psychoacoustically thinking that you'll hear a reflection after after some time. Pretty like much. That. And you know, even if I were to blindfold you and I make you stand saying, oh, you, you can still tell if you're in an open space or if you're in a closed room or if you're yes, in a fully sound. reflective room, right? So it's because of two, three aspects. One is how quickly, the earliest reflections, how quickly are you getting them? So these early reflections are what make a place sound intimate. So. The intimacy of a setting is basically because of the early reflections mm. that, that come in. Yeah. So that's one aspect which is hard to control in these kind of spaces. In larger spaces. So it was, so the Royal Albert Hall was, uh, you know, given rich composers haven't really com contributed as much to Western classical music as other you know, German or Russian composers or Polish composers have So we're have hoping done. this video is not seen by anyone uh, in the UK. I'm hoping. <laughs> but, but no, this is on wiki, so it's not, I'm not saying something that's not, not being <laughs> said before. Uh, so, so given that, this was known as the only, this was joked about as being the only place where a British composer could be sure of hearing his work played twice. <laughs> So, um, but this and was corrected to a great extent later with uh, clouds, specific clouds to bring in early reflections. So the, the the job of these clouds is they also work as absorbers, but the the main job was to send reflections back sooner yeah. rather than the, the doing the entire the excursion. No, I've, so I've heard a concert there, and I, I think one of my favorite demo tracks is Adele live at not just Adele. I've got Adele live at. Royal Albert Hall, I've got the Killers live at Royal Albert Hall and they've also done a great job of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great place now, I mean, it's, yeah, it's been... It sounds fabulous.